Okay. Can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. All righty. Oh, jeepers. I've just, let me get into my presenter view. Okay. Hi, everyone. Again, my name's Leslie Fall. Kinder, Leslie, if you see your um, notes, if you want to swap the display real quick. Oh, that. okay. Yep. There okay. you go. <laughs> oh, that's weird. Okay, now I'm going to look cockeyed at you all. I'm <laughs> going to be looking at the, my wrong monitor. But my name is Leslie Falkinder. And again, I'm an OT and a hub member. And we are going to talk about sensory based interventions for supporting youth in schools with a multi tiered system of support. And happy last day of Sensory Processing Awareness Month. You probably didn't know, but it is the month of October, so it's fitting that this is what we're talking about today. And our goals are to first understand the key differences between air sensory integration and sensory-based interventions. Secondly, to recognize how sensory-based interventions can support all students in schools within an educational setting by applying a three-tiered educational framework, then appreciate sensory processing differences and the three key power senses, and then reference examples of sensory-based interventions at each tier. So the provision of sensory-based interventions aligns really well with this multi-tiered systems of support framework, or MTSS that is part, for anyone unfamiliar, part of ESSA or Every Student Succeeds Act, which was the 2015 reauthorization of IDEA. And it's designed to provide varying levels of support to students based on their individual needs. Mm -hmm. So it usually has these three tiers, as you see represented. So tier one at the bottom represents universal supports for all students through the high quality instruction and proactive classroom management. And then tier two in the middle there are targeted interventions for smaller groups of students that might need additional help. And then um, tier three represents more intensive or individualized supports for students with significant needs. And this often involves more one-on-one -on -one interventions and specific strategies. So the, the framework as a whole emphasizes data-driven decisions, um, making um, and collaborating with um, educators on these decisions. And the goal is to ensure that all students receive appropriate support, not only to achieve academically, but also socially and behaviorally. So when I say sensory processes, Assessing, I'm referring to how we perceive, interpret, and respond to sensory information and the environment via eight main domains or sensory channels. So visual, auditory, gustatory, tactile, olfactory, vestibular, and proprioceptive, and then interoception or interoceptive sense, which is often referred to as our eighth sense. And it's our ability to recognize internal sensations. So knowing that uh, your stomach is growling and that might indicate hunger um, and some of the ideas behind um, knowing that your racing heart or your sweaty palms might indicate anxiousness. Yeah. So next, I want to clarify real briefly some terms. The first is AIRS sensory integration. So this is a theory founded by an occupational therapist, A. Jean Ayers, in the early 70s. And it's the foundational framework to understanding and treating sensory processing issues. Um, it has very specialized and lengthy training, and the eval process is also lengthy, and it has a set of 10 discrete fidelity measures. So the goal simply is long-term change. So you can think of kind of from a neurological standpoint, a bottom-up process. Um, and it focuses very much initially on the, the foundation senses of proprioceptive, vestibular, and tactile systems, because those foundational senses, when processed and um, working well together, are provide um, for building skill development, um, for need, needed for learning and daily activities and thing like things like that. Some key concepts 
our play, child-led approach, and something called the Just Right Challenge. And it's harder to implement within an educational framework because of the time involved, the equipment involved, and the fidelity measures that are required. But there are some recent studies in the last five years that have come out regarding ASI in schools. So then sensory-based interventions, which is what we're talking about today. These are techniques and strategies and environmental modifications, and they can be used at school or home or in therapy. And, and they target either a single one of those eight domains that I was talking about or multiple domains. And it's designed, they are designed to influence behavior and attention. And in contrast to air sensory integration, we're talking about more short-term in the moment change with SBIs. They should still only be initiated following either an observation of the context or a formal assessment of a child within the environment and by an occupational therapy practitioner. And because less specialized training is needed, they can be embedded more easily into a student's daily routines by teachers or any school staff under the guidance, again, of an OTP. So why do they even matter? Well, prevalence, five to 16.5% of the general population of the US do exhibit atypical sensory rec reactions. And in children with developmental delays or neurodivergent kiddos, the percentage is significantly higher. So as high as 95% for those diagnosed with autism. And more research is definitely needed. And we don't have enough time to talk about some of the controversies surrounding sensory interventions. But with that caveat in mind, the appropriate use of sensory-based interventions can allow for greater particip participation at school, um, better co-regulation and self-regulation for students, an increased sense of felt safety because providing sensory tools can create predictable, safe environments, which lowers anxiety and hypervigilance, and then improved relationships. So when kids feel more safe and more regulated, they're better able to connect with the people in their environment. So there are eight key domains that I already touched base on, and it's obvious that tactile touch, that re we receive that information through our skin. But with proprioceptive input, it's kind of a hidden sense, and that input is received through muscle receptors in our joints and our muscles. And then vestibular, another hidden sense, that input is received through the semicircular canals of our inner ear, kind of like our GPS. And then interoception, that input is received, I mentioned earlier, through our internal organs. And next, I just, I want to show you a portion of this video. It's an oldie but a goodie because this young man, Neil, does just a great job of explaining the seven senses, interoception is not included, and sensory processing, as well as neurological thresholds of response in a very practical way. Hi, my name is Neil. I like classical music. I like to read comics. I also like to go to school. Something that I know a lot about and want to tell you about is sensory processing disorder. SPD is when the messages that your brain gets from your senses are not organized, so you don't respond to things like most people do. This makes it hard to do everyday life stuff like getting ready for the day, going to school, eating and playing. You can have SPD by itself, or you can have it with other things, like autism. I have autism and SPD. Everyone has seven sensory systems. They are sound, taste, smell, vision, touch, proprioceptive, and vestibular. Responsive versus over-responsive. You can think of each your sensory systems as being a cup. And water is that type 
of a sensory input. If you are under-responsive to a certain sensory input, it is like you're a big, huge cup. You keep getting water to the big cup. You can just keep adding and adding, but it never feels full. But if you are over-responsive, it is like you are a tiny cup. All you need is just a little sensory input and you overflow. You want your cup to be full and not spill over. Each of your sensory systems is their own cup and they are different sizes. Just because you have one big cup does not mean you are under-responsive with all your senses. I have a big cup for my proprioceptive and vestibular senses and a little cup for my touch, sound, taste, and smell senses. Everyone is a different and unique. So while I'm waiting for my slides to catch up, I want to touch on some examples of various sensory-based interventions and the power senses. So we call the three sensory domains of deep touch pressure, proprioception, and vestibular, the power senses, because they really provide kind of the biggest bang for our buck, if you will. Input via these senses can have a stronger and more lasting impact. So the first one is deep touch pressure. And um, with deep touch pressure, the effects can last 90 minutes to two hours. And some examples are included here on the slide, compression vests, crawling, crawling through a Lycra tunnel, fidget tools uh, and, and sensory beads, therapeutic putty, uh, deep pressure provided using a therapy ball or a bean bag, brushing and Qigong massage. And there, are, some of these interventions do have more research supporting them than others. So power sense number two then is proprioception, which is engaged when we use our muscles and, and joints against resistance. And it can impact our bodies for 90 minutes to four hours, depending on whether it's active or passive. So I have some active examples on our slide, pushing, pulling activities, hanging like on the monkey bars carrying heavy items, chewing, doing push-ups, or squeezing against a resistance. And then passive, as an example, is a joint compression. And then the third power sense is input provided to our vestibular system. And the effects of this can last from two to six hours. And examples can be either calming or alerting, depending on how the it's delivered, so slow, linear, predictable movement, such as the examples listed, is more calming. Fast movement, movement that changes directions or is bumpy or jerky is going to be more alerting, such as those things listed on our slide or uh, exercise such as a windmill. And then touching on these four domains, auditory, visual, olfactory, and gustatory, in schools, we tend to use input options for these four more as environmental modifications or adaptations for the student. And then examples of interoception activities. So there are whole curriculums available for developing interoceptive awareness, but examples can be using body scanning, body mapping, teaching and using um, breathing exercises or calming routines and mindfulness, mindfulness activities. And there is a link with some examples on your slides, um, the PDF version that you guys have. So at all three tiers, it's very, very important um, to focus on some of the, the things that are listed on this slide. So first of all is assessment. Um, by an OT and guidance by the same for best practice. So um, informal assessment in the form of observation or questionnaires or interviews um, of the context is what is used as assessment at the first two tiers. Um, so we're not assessing an individual child. If after tier one and tier two, it is found that maybe there's an individual student that the team may be considering for um, intensive intervention, then parental consent has to be obtained per IDEA for any formal assessment moving past tier one or two. 
It's also important with the multi-tiered system of support model that there's data collection, that there's progress mo monitoring of the specific change that is to be seen or that we're looking for, and then collaboration between all team members is important. So tier one, again, universal support. And there is a link to this little checklist that I just love. It's from the Mad River Local School folks in Ohio. They work with the Montgomery County ESC Autism and Low Incidence Coaching Team. It's an OT and a PT who provided this checklist. And it actually allows for the therapist to provide info to the parents on the strategies that are gonna be used in their classroom. And then it asks that the parents opt out in writing if they don't want their child involved. So some, some examples of tier one sensory-based interventions. And again, this, these are designed to meet the population, either a classroom or a school, after um, an assessment has occurred of the context, would be providing an in-service, much like what I'm doing with you all today, or making mild modifications to classroom routines that might help all, like offering a calming or recentering break following recess if children are having a hard time getting back to academics, or teaching teachers to begin to use universal scripts for promoting interoceptive awareness, getting them to tune in or notice their um, bodily cues, or using things like the link I've provided up with the calm moment cards from Every Moment Counts, many ways of incorporating sensory-based interventions that can be used at any tiers. Any of the tiers is, are listed on those Calm Moment cards. And here's some pictures of some tier one intervention. So starting at the top right and moving clockwise. So an example of modifying a classroom environment, you can see the difference in these classrooms, but a visually calm environment versus a visually cluttered environment can make a world of difference for a child um, and a classroom in a tier one intervention or providing instruction and modeling for the flexible seating options that might be in the classroom or suggesting a sensory toolbox or movement-based video videos like Cosmic Kids Yoga or Go Noodle videos based on observation of the context. And then the last thing that I wanted to show you is um, Granny's Wacky Prize. It's an example of a tier one intervention. Oops, is he in the Let me get it over to, can you guys see this, Kara? <laughs> Can we see it? Anyone want to chime in? Yes, sorry. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so um, I'm going to let it run, but in mute. So it's a behavioral modification, well, a behavioral reinforcement strategy. It's a bag. And when children have done a great job, the, the teacher allows them to pull a uh, activity out of the bag and the OT and the PT have informed the contents of the bag by adding some sensory motor choices. So what um, this was that she, the child pulled out was they get to act like a baby. They're all very excited about it. Some don't end up being excited about it. So she um, spends a little time then telling them all the great things she saw them do and reminding them when it's time to stop and then she sets them loose for 30 seconds of this act like a baby activity, which some kids enjoy more than others. We have a kid with some auditory sensitivity right here. So you get the idea of that. Um, so now I need to, yikes, I'm going to minimize that. All right. So tier two supports, um, we're talking again about more targeted supports for groups. And I love, again, the link that I provided for you because this part of the link, this page allows the therapist to specify which targeted supports to be used for the teacher and then provides them instruction on what to do if a tier two support is used with frequency to let other members of the team know. 
So again, tier two, we're talking about more specific training to at-risk students or to staff who are supporting at-risk students. We're talking more about focused interoceptive lessons for children or some social emotional supports. And here are some examples. Something that I've done a lot with tier two interventions is like a lunch bunch or a small group for whatever topic is needed by my, my at-risk group of students. Um, providing a specific sensory toolbox to the classroom and in combination with reading a sensory specific book like Arnie and his school tools or why does Izzy cover her ears and providing targeted alternative seating. So an area of the classroom that might have for at-risk students, a standing desk and a wiggle uh, strap for the base of the chairs or a specific calming corner. So we're, when we're at tier three and we're, we're rounding third here, we have individualized sensory plans and more direct intervention and environmental supports for a specific student or tailored sensory diets for kiddos that might have significant sensory needs or interoceptive challenges. And the goal in a school setting when we use sensory based intervention is not necessarily to improve the processing of sensory input, that's air sensory integration, but rather to increase access to and participation in those activities throughout the day. So examples might be um, for this tier three intervention, individual, individualized sensory diets that are used kind of proactively throughout the whole day um, or develop calming routines that are to be used more in the moment or reactively for a dysregulated student, and then providing interoceptive awareness intervention for kiddos, um, more intensive support, or providing access to very specific sensory strategies within sensory rooms, and then doing a lot of focus collaboration with staff to implement the strategies based on students' needs. And so this is what some of those might look like. You know, a lot of times on an individual education plan, people will say sensory supports to be provided, but how to put those um, into actual use within the school day is difficult, especially um, for children that might have um, lower language abilities or low reading levels. So examples of adding visual supports are added here on this screen. So um, for example, we've call, we've changed the fancy names of proprioception to green choices and the student might have six appropriate green choices for his or her needs. And so because this child does not necessarily have the reading level to support all of this, she's able to use these icons or photos. And then also we can embed a self-monitoring piece um, for the student, such as how do I feel and circle a number or to the bottom right using a Google form. So this is my last slide and I wanted to show you a sensory break in action. And this is again from the Montgomery ESC autism coaching team. Okay, so he's taken his easy roller to his proactively scheduled sensory break, and this is a paraprofessional helping him. And um, I just love their interaction, but I'm going to fast forward it. <laughs> so the first thing he does when he gets to the area that they're working in is to check in, and this is a zones of reg regulation, green, yellow, blue, and red check-in chart. And she's saying, well, I saw you. You looked, you looked like you were a calm in the green zone to me, too. And then he's sequencing his sensory activities. And it looks like they're color coded and they have um, photos to um, indicate what he's choosing. And so the first one I'm fast forwarding is he's tossing a weighted ball back and forth with some heavy work. And then he does another heavy work activity where he's carrying some weighted items. 
And then finally, I believe he chose a little rocking chair. So he's doing some calming, linear vestibular input while he handles a fidget. And then at the end, he uses that easy roller, which is also a vestibular input, to head back to his classroom. So that is my presentation. Thank you so much all for your attention. The link should all be in your PDF version of my slides. My last two slides are references. And if we have any time at all, I'm happy to answer any questions.